All right. Well, uh, open up your Bibles to Daniel chapter 4, or actually chapter 5. Uh, we're going to pick up there, Daniel chapter 5, and um, we're picking up in this series that we started back in, uh, uh, back in the wintertime, springtime, and uh, we're going to continue through the rest of the narrative portions of Daniel this fall here over the next five weeks or so. So uh, I'd encourage you to go back maybe and read some of the first four chapters to kind of familiarize yourself with the, uh, uh, the story that we talked about before. Um, and, uh, and that'll kind of help you get ready for what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. Now, if you're like me and you grew up in the 80s and the 90s, um, you are familiar uh, with this little Italian guy that we used to play in video games. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Yeah. Mario, right? And he had a brother named Luigi. Um, I mean, this was like a cultural phenomenon. Every, you know, if you, if you had kids in the 80s or in the 90s, you probably understand who Mario is as well. Um, and today we're talking about pride power-ups. And if you don't know what a power-up is, in the video game world, you had all these different power-ups. And the more Mario games that they have made, the more power-ups they have had to come up with. And some of them are just downright weird these days. Um, you know, used to, it was just like a mushroom and a fire flower. That was basically about all you could get, maybe a star here and there. Uh, but these power-ups take regular Mario. He may be small or he may be big. They take regular Mario and they give him some extra powers, you know, like he can throw fireballs or he can fly or something like that. Um, and uh, the cool thing about the power-ups is it lets you do more things in the video game. But there's not any power-up that makes you permanently invincible, at least not one that I have found. A star will make you invincible for a little while unless you jump off a cliff. You know, there's nothing that saves you from that. Um, but it eventually wears out. And these other power-ups, you can keep them for a while, but they can be lost in, at a moment's notice. If something happens, you can lose that power-up, and all of a sudden, the whole, your whole strategy falls apart. And so these power-ups, are they amplify Mario's abilities, but they can't save you permanently from a downfall. Well, today we're going to talk about pride's power-ups, because there are certain things in our life that we have that come into our life that tend to make us feel like we're stronger than we really are, that we can do things that we really can't do, and that, that pride that's in our life, it tends to kind of amplify that pride. And here in this story in Daniel chapter 5, we see that happening in a new king's life. So if you remember back in Daniel chapter 4, just or 1 through 4 to kind of recap, that was the story of the interactions between Daniel and King Neb. Remember we called him Neb because Nebuchadnezzar is too hard to say, right? And so uh, King Neb and Daniel, four chapters. And at the end, <clears throat> at the end of chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar, King Neb, had just described how he had been elevated in pride and then how God had humbled him and took a, taken away his kingdom. And then when he humbled himself before God, God restored him to his, uh, to his kingly glory. And so he ends Daniel chapter 4. The last word that we have from King Neb, I believe, shows us that King Neb came to a faith in God. Because he says in verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and glorify the king of the heavens, because all his works are true and his ways are just. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. <clears throat> and so Daniel chapter 4 ends with this statement from King Neb, one of the most powerful kings. He reigned for about 40 years uh, or so. One of the most powerful kings in that Babylonian era, the only one who reigned for that length of time, the greatest Babylonian king, he said, the God of the Hebrews, basically is what he said, he is able to humble those who walk in pride. And then we enter into chapter 5, and we see this story of King Belshazzar. And we're going to see that he is extremely prideful. And so it's a compare and contrast kind of situation. But it doesn't just go from King Neb to King Bel. That's what we're going to call him because I don't want to say Belshazzar over and over and over. Okay, so King Neb to King Bel. It doesn't just jump to him. There's a lot of kings in between. There's about a 20 year span between the end of Daniel 4 and the beginning of Daniel chapter 5. King Neb reigns until his death in about 562. Um, his son, which is, has a wonderful name, his name is Evil Merodach. Um, I don't know why you guys didn't pick that biblical name for your kids. You know, um, we like to name our kids Joshua and stuff like that. You know, good biblical names. Evil Merodach is an option. Um, but that means man of Marduk. So maybe you don't want to name him that. But he comes to power. Um, he isn't mentioned in the story of Daniel, but he is mentioned in 2 Kings 25 and Jeremiah 52. He reigns for two years, and then he is murdered by his brother-in-law, Nergal Sherezar. 
Okay, we're going to call him Nurgle, okay? Um, so Nurgle murders his brother-in-law after two years, and he becomes king. He's mentioned in Jeremiah 39 because he was one of King Neb's officials. Um, but then whenever he is king, he reigns for about five years, from 560 to 556. And so he's got about a five-year time span. And then his son uh, succeeds him. His son is called Labashai Marduk. We're going to call him King Lab, okay? So King Lab succeeds as king, and he's assassinated after two months, okay? After two months, and he's assassinated. Uh, and uh, then another family member, this is a great family. I mean, this may feel like some of your family reunions, I don't know. Um, but these guys apparently didn't get along well. So King Nabonidus um, replaced Labash Labashai, and he reigned for about 17 years. So he actually had a fairly long tenure. Um, and some people believe he was probably part of that group that assassinated King Lab. Well, around year seven of his reign, uh, this new king, Nabonidus, was having some issues with the local religious authorities because he didn't believe in uh, Marduk like some of the other, most of the other religious groups there in Babylon did, and they were giving him some trouble. So he decided he would put his son as co-king, co-heir, over the kingdom, and he went out to the Arabian Peninsula to a oasis, and he vacationed for ten years. Um, pretty good, pretty good gig, right? I mean, like you build up the business, you let your son manage it, and you go and you vacation for uh, you know for ten years. Well, that's what he does. But the problem is, his son is King Belshazzar, and like happens sometimes whenever somebody is given something that they didn't work for. They wind up kind of squandering it and kind of running it into the ground, so to speak. And so we see here this story of King Bel um, and the trouble that he is going to get himself into. And so Belshazzar and Nabonidus are kind of co-kings uh, in the time frame. And we think that this happens during that time frame where there's still, uh, you know, the Babylonian Empire is going to come to an end at the end of ch chapter 5. It's going to switch to the Persian and Medes. Um, we think that this happens when they're still both kings because the promise that uh, Belshazzar makes in verse 7 is that whoever can read the writing on the wall, he will make him the third most powerful person in the kingdom. So you'd have King Nabonidus, King Bel, and this new person who had just read the writing on the wall. So most likely this is still when these two kings are reigning. Okay, So that's your history lesson for the day. Let's get into uh, where we are here. So chapter 4 has ended. King Neb said, he is able, God is able to humble those who walk in pride. And as we look in this various forms of pride, we're going to see um, that certain things, this is kind of our main point today, or one of our main points, certain things in life left unchecked amplify our pridefulness, okay? Certain things in our life will amplify our pridefulness if we don't keep them in check. And Paul understood this, okay? He, he understood this whenever he was writing to, uh, to the Corinthian believers because Paul was, a, Paul was a pretty great guy. I mean, not personality-wise so much. I don't know if he had a great personality. He's pretty abrasive. Um, but he was a brilliant man. He was a powerful man. He was a well-respected man as a Jewish uh, uh, religious leader. And then he later became a very well-respected man in the Christian world as well. And so we get to uh, the letter of Corinthians, the second letter of Corinthians, and in verse 12, chapter 12, verse 6, he says, If I want to boast, I wouldn't be a fool because I would be telling the truth. Now, listen, husbands, this is probably not a great way to begin an argument with your wives. Listen, whenever I speak, I'm not a fool because I speak the truth. I mean, that's probably not a great way to begin a conversation or argument, but that's how Paul begins this conversation. He's like, look, I'm about to brag, or I mean, I could brag, and I wouldn't be lying. I'd be telling the truth because truly, honestly, I'm a great, wonderful person, okay? And so he says, because I would be telling the truth, but I will spare you. <laughs> and husbands, if you start this way, your wife will please probably say, please spare me, you know? But I will spare you so that no one can credit me with something beyond what he sees in me or hears from me, especially, verse 7, especially because of the extraordinary revelations. Think about the things that Paul shared with people, the revelations from God, amazing things. Therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, 
I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that in Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, Paul understood that even though he had some things to be proud of, some things that he could boast in, he wasn't going to boast in those because whenever you amplify those things that you're good at, whenever you kind of lean into that pride that's in your life or that's in your heart that's trying to get out, it usually leads to a downfall. And so he leaned towards weakness, leaned towards humility in his life. That's the same thing that King Neb ended chapter 4 in. But when we look at Belshazzar, we see something different. Let's read in Daniel chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It says, King Belshazzar held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine in their presence. Under the influence of the wine, Belshazzar gave orders to bring in the gold and silver vessels that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, wives, and concubines could drink from them. So they brought in the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the kings and his nobles, wives, and concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised their God, made of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So that's our opening passage today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we pray that today through the story of King Belshazzar that you will enlighten us and help us to see the pride that tends to creep up in our life and even those things that tend to amplify and our pride and make us think that we're even greater than we are. So Lord God, I pray that you will just uh, speak to us today and really open our eyes to see those areas in our life where we need to humble ourselves before you. So God, we thank you for this scripture and we pray you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I want to look at five things that we see in King Bell's story that amplify, that tend to boost our pride and lead us even further down that road towards a downfall. And there's many things that we could say amplify the pride in our life, but these five things I think we can find in this passage specifically. So I want to look at them today. And so the first one that amplifies, it's like a pride power up for us, is position. Position can very often amplify the pride that we have in our life. And we have this here in verse 1, and it's very simple. It says, King Belshazzar. He was the king, right? He was the one who was ruling. Even if it was one of those situations where daddy said, here's a throne, he was still the king, and he still commanded authority or had authority, commanded respect because of his position. So his position worked to amplify his pride. And our position can often lead us to have feelings of superiority. Whether you earn the position or you were given the position, it can lead to a feeling of superiority around, uh, above those who are underneath our leadership. An ancient philosopher, uh, Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu said, Avoid putting yourself before others and you can become a leader among men. You know, <clears throat> throughout the scripture and throughout history, we've seen that some of the greatest leaders have been those who lead through the act of service not through a dictatorship or being some sort of commanding person, but they have won and won the affection and won the respect of the people that follow them. And so position can be something that whenever it's given to somebody, it can kind of cause that pride that's already kind of small inside us to well up and to become something even bigger because we think, I have the position, so you're going to listen to me and do what I say. Paul warns about this when he's talking about um, elders and leaders in the church. He says in 1 Timothy 3, 6, that one of these leaders must not be a new convert or he might become conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. He didn't want new converts put in these positions of leadership because they, they needed to have the maturity underneath them to understand that there's nothing inside them that warrants this leadership role, but it's what God is doing in them that warrants a role of leadership. There's really, um, this is a reality about important and powerful positions that it amplifies us. It makes us think that we are greater than we really are. So we need to guard against letting our position cause more pride to well up in our life. Another thing that we see in this one, uh, in this story of King Bell, is alcohol. Alcohol is a pride power up. Now, today we're not talking about is it okay to drink alcohol or is it not okay to drink alcohol? That'll be a topic for another day. But I think what we're talking about here is the very clear influence that alcohol and drunkenness has on the decisions that happen here in this story. So this story, the stage is set for this whole chapter in the first four verses. It tells what is going on when all these circumstances and when God intervenes. The first four verses tell us what's happening when God shows up. And all four verses 
reference the fact that King Bell and his posse are drinking alcohol. And when we've talked about this before, whenever something is repeated over and over and over in a passage of Scripture, that writer is trying to bring up a point, is trying to make a point. This is an important part of this story. <clears throat> and so verse 1 says that they were drinking wine. Verse 2 says he was under the influence of wine. Verse 3 says that they drank. And verse 4 says that they were drinking. And so they're point, trying to point out wine and being drunk is central to what is going on in this story. Now, it's not the only influence that leads to Baal's downfall. I don't believe that, but it's a central part of this story. So verse 2 says, Under the influence of the wine, King Bel gave orders to bring in the gold and silver vessels that his predecessor, King Neb, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, wives, and concubines could drink from them. So he brought in those things that were supposed to be dedicated to the worship of Yahweh, of the God of Israel. And he said, hey, fill them up with wine. We're going to get drunk with these elements that are sacred and devoted to the God of the Hebrews. And so he was dishonoring and disrespecting God because these vessels, they were supposed to be used in the worship within the temple, within the tabernacle. They were, dis- they were, they were dedicated only to the worship of the Lord and were supposed to be used for no other purpose. But for King Neb, it was basically like having a keg at a keg party. And this is what they were using to get themselves drunk. And so he desecrated the, t- the vessels of the Lord. And it all starts out with verse 2 saying, Under the influence of the wine, King Bel gave this order. You know, Proverbs 20 verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, beer is a brawler. Whoever goes astray because of them is not wise. So in other words, if you allow alcohol to get into your body, And it begins to influence the decisions that you make. And it leads you away from doing things that you otherwise would not do as a follower of the Bible, as a follower of the Lord. Then you are walking opposite of the direction that God would have you to walk. And that is called sin. And so if you are under the influence of wine and you're letting your, uh, or alcohol, and you're letting your body and your mind be led astray because of that in your body, then you're walking away from God's perfect plan for you. And so, you know, some people might say, well, I didn't mean to get drunk, but you decided to take that drink and to begin walking down that road. You created an opportunity for it to happen. And I've heard people say, well, what about, I mean, we, cap- we talk about this in, what about gluttony? We know, you know, we don't talk about gluttony. Well, you know, I've never heard a story about somebody who got so full at a buffet that they went home and they abused their family. You know, I've never heard that. Um, I've heard of people who, like, they have a heart attack while they're driving. Maybe they cause an accident. But that is extremely rare continu- con- compared to the effects of drunk driving in our nation and the, the uh, difficulty or the, the damage that that does in people's life. The World Health Organization says that 50, 50, uh, sorry, 55% of domestic abuse in the world happens when the abuser has been drinking alcohol. Over half of the cases worldwide, over half of the cases of domestic abuse happen after some, uh, the, per- the person abusing has had alcohol. Alcoholism affects families mentally, emotionally, and financially, spiritually. It's a significant problem. Thankfully, like all problems we face, there is a solution that begins at the foot of the cross. Romans 13, 14 says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. He doesn't say, hey, try to avoid sin. Do your very best to avoid sin. Try to live better. You know, muster up some strength and live better. He says, no. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the fleshly desires. So if you live and lean into Christ, those desires that come into your life will begin to lose their effect, lose their hold, lose their power over you because you are being more under the influence of Jesus than you are under the influence of other things. Now, if this is a situation in your life that you struggle with, alcoholism, the the tendency to go towards alcoholism or any other dependency in your life, I want to tell you that there are opportunities for you to get help, and I want to encourage you to seek those opportunities out. Uh, We have counseling services here at our church through Stillwater's Counseling Services. We also have a ministry that specifically helps people overcome hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And that's our Celebrate Recovery ministry that meets on uh, Thursday evenings at 7 o'clock, just right across the street. I would encourage you to connect to our Celebrate Recovery ministry because some of these people have gone through those same dependency issues that you are struggling with and they can help you see freedom on the other side of that. And so alcohol is one of those things that can be a major pride power up in our life because it very often makes us feel more powerful and smart and brilliant and funny than we really are. 
Number three, we see peer pressure here in this situation. Verse two and three and four all talk about the king, his nobles, wives, and concubines. So he's got this party. How many were in the room? A thousand people. That's a big party, you know? That's a big party. And he's getting them all, um, uh, giving them all food, giving them all drink. And um, all this peer pressure is coming on King Neb to do something amazing, to really show them that he is a powerful, awesome, amazing king. And so he says, let's drink from the vessels that these, these Hebrew, uh, Hebrew uh, people here, they're, they're gods. You know, we have peer pressure that come into our life. We have those you know, phrases like, everyone is doing it. You look around, you think everybody is doing the thing that I'm not doing. I wish that I could have all the fun that they are having or enjoy the things that they are enjoying. And have you ever heard somebody say, maybe parents, you might be guilty of saying this at some point or another. Well, if everyone was jumping off, jump off a cliff too. Have you ever said that? I mean, let's not raise our hands and say that, you know, but we've probably said that if everybody was jumping off a cliff, would you jump off the cliff too? And the reasonable answer is no. I wouldn't jump off a cliff just because Joe jumped off a cliff. I mean, I'm not that dumb. But, you know, the reality is there are some times when somebody gets into a group of people and they start doing something extreme and they just join right in with them. Um, many, I mean, you've, you've probably heard either through being alive in that time period or through studying history about the Manson family in California and how they just began to, people began to get into this group with Charles Manson. All of a sudden they started you know, committing murders, and they just didn't see anything wrong with it because they were just going along with the crowd. And that was extreme, you know? Usually it's not that extreme. But Proverbs does talk about this. Proverbs 1, 10 through 18, don't be tempted by sinners or listen when they say, come on, let's gang up and kill somebody just for the fun of it. They're well and healthy now, but we'll finish them off once and for all. We'll take their valuables and fill our homes with stolen goods. If you join our gang, you'll get your share. You know, that's extreme, but there's that temptation. Verse 15 says, don't follow anyone like that or do what they do. They're in a big hurry to commit some crime, perhaps even murder, but they are all, they are like a bird that sees the bait, but ignores the trap. They gang up to murder someone, but they are the victims. He's saying they are the ones who are going to ultimately have a fall. And so sometimes we have such a radical temptation and we do fall into that, but most of the time peer pressure comes along and it's very, very subtle. And it's a case of being led astray by someone else who is going astray. And before you know it, instead of you seeing Joe jump off the cliff, you think, oh, yeah, I'll do that too. You just both accidentally fall off the cliff. That's how peer pressure usually gets you. You both accidentally wind up in a place that you didn't want to be. And the, the scripture talks about that as well. Matthew 15, 12, as uh, Jesus says some things that are difficult to, uh, for, for people to hear, and the Pharisees especially, the disciples come up and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? And then in verse 14, Jesus says, Leave them alone, for they're blind guides. And if the blind guide the blind, both will fall into a pit. You know, if we just go along with our peers, with what the world around us is doing, they're going to lead us down a road that we didn't intend to go down. And before we realize it, we're already lost down that path. Now, there's always the opportunity to turn and face back to Jesus, and he will set our path straight. But we need to realize that peer pressure is subtle very often. You know, when I was growing up in in high school, we kind of had this cliche that the answer to every question you got asked in Sunday school was either Jesus or peer pressure, right? If it was a good answer, it was Jesus. If it was a bad answer, it was peer pressure. Um, But, you know, peer pressure is subtle, and it's in so many different areas of our life that we have to be aware of it. Uh, Another thing that we see, a pride power up is wealth. In verse 3, they brought in the gold vessels that have been taken from the temple. So all this gold, everything that glittered, it was glitzy. It was tempting to King Bel. And we see throughout the Bible how wealth tends to take people down a road they don't want to go and how it's hard for them to surrender wealth and follow Jesus. For example, the rich young ruler, Luke, verse, uh, Luke chapter 18, he asked Jesus how to be saved. And Jesus says, you know, you got you to gotta keep the law. And he says, well, uh, I have kept the law. And that really wasn't Jesus' point. He says, but this one thing you lack, sell everything that you have and follow me. See, the law was works-based, sell everything you have and follow me. That's faith-based. And he said, I want you to lose every, leave everything behind and follow after me. And it says that that rich young ruler walked away sad because he had many possessions. Wealth can be a power-up for pride because it does so much for us. One of the most difficult people to come to faith in Jesus Christ is a 
rich person. That's what Jesus says, verse 24 of Luke 18, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. When you have enough money to do anything that you need to do, it's hard to trust and have faith in Jesus. When you're poor and you have barely enough to make it from paycheck to paycheck, it's easy to trust in Jesus, right? Because you're like, Lord, please let this money stretch a little bit further. But whenever you have unlimited resources, often it's hard to depend on Jesus instead of the resources that you have. 1 Timothy 6 warns, The love of money is the roots of all kinds of evil, and by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. We need money to live life. It's a necessary resource, but it's not an, it doesn't need to come an idol that we depend on above the Lord. And that leads into our fifth thing that we see here is idolatry. Verse 4. In verse 4 of Daniel chapter 5, they, you see idolatry. They drank the wine and praised their gods made of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And so those things that were in their life bolstered their pride. They thought, we're drinking from the vessels of the God of the Hebrews. That must mean that our gods are greater and more powerful than, they, than, than Yahweh. And so they were desecrating the Hebrew God and worshiping their God because they believed that their gods were more powerful. They elevated their gods uh, as being more powerful than the God of Israel. King Neb had figured out otherwise. And if they would have read his story, then they would understand that their gods were nothing. Our success can become idols. Notice it says the gods that were made of gold, silver, and bronze. These were gods that had to have been fashioned by human hands. And very often our successes can become idols that power up our pride. A great business, amassing a lot of wealth, having people look at us as experts in our field. All these things can pump up the pride in our life. You know, and Paul talked about that. We read that other verse earlier. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, he says, More than that, I consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and could consider them as dung. Yes, that's what he said. So that I may gain Christ. He says, look, all the good works, all the greatness that I have, it's like a pile of something that the dog left in the yard compared to knowing Jesus. That is how he considered all of his abilities compared to Christ. And so we don't need to let anything in our life become so important that we think, I can handle this without God. I can do this without God. This right here in my life, this area in my life is better than what God can do for me because that becomes idolatry. And so that's that first problem that we see in, uh, in our life as we let pride get in the way that certain things in life amplify our pridefulness. But the second problem is that as we have more pride in our life, pride leads to our downfall. It leads to our downfall, right? You've heard that verse, which we'll read in a moment, that pride comes before a fall. In Daniel 5, 5 through 31, we're going to read the rest of this story, okay? So if you have your Bibles open there, let's read the rest of the story of King Bel together. It says, after they were drinking all, you know, after they were drinking all this stuff and having this party, at that moment, verse 5, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and began writing on the plaster of the king's palace wall next to the lampstand. As the king watched the hand that was writing, his face turned pale and his thoughts so terrified him that he sold himself and his knees knocked together. Now, I just read that passage right, okay? Now, a lot of translations say that his hips came loose, okay? They're trying to make this sound not as gross as it really is, but the Hebrew idiom that is here in the original language literally means that he lost control of himself, okay? So he was so terrified by this finger riding on the wall that he wet his britches, all right? And so this is a bad situation. This powerful king with all thousands of his nobles just embarrassed himself in front of them all. But the king shouted, in verse 7, the king shouted to bring in the mediums, Chaldeans, and diviners. He said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this inscription and gives me its interpretation will be clothed in purple, have a gold chain around his neck, have the third highest position in the kingdom. So all the king's wise men came in, but none could read the inscription or make his interpretation known to him. And then King Bel became even more terrified. His face turned pale and his nobles were bewildered. Because of the outcry of the king and his nobles, the queen came to the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't let your thoughts terrify you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the days of your predecessor, he was found to have insight, intelligence, and wisdom. 
Like the wisdom of the gods, your predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, mediums, Chaldeans, and diviners. Your own predecessor, the king, did this because Daniel, the one the king named Belteshazzar, was found to have an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and intelligence, and the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve the problems. Therefore, summon Daniel, and he will give the interpretation. So she said, hey, look, King Neb figured this out. You should have read his story and understand what was going on. You need to call this guy Daniel. And then verse 13, so Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the Judean exiles that my predecessor, the king, brought from Judah? I've heard that you have a spirit of the gods in you, and that insight, intelligence, and extraordinary wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, mediums, were brought before me to read this inscription. It makes its interpretation known to me, but they could not give its interpretation. However, I've heard that you can give the interpretation and solve problems. Therefore, if you can read it, give me its interpretation. You will be clothed in purple, have a gold chain around your neck, and have the third highest position in the kingdom. You're going to have riches, wealth, power, and position. That's a lot of the things we just read about, right? And listen to Daniel's response. You can keep your gifts. (laughs) You can keep your gifts and give your rewards to someone else. However... I'll still read the inscription for the king and make the interpretation known to him. Your majesty, the most high God, gave sovereignty, greatness, glory, and majesty to your predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar. Because of the greatness he gave him, all the peoples, nations, and languages were terrified and fearful of him. He killed anyone he wanted and kept alive anyone he wanted. He exalted anyone he wanted and he humbled anyone he wanted. But when his heart was exalted and his spirit became arrogant, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven away from people. His mind was like an animal's. He lived with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with dew from the sky until he acknowledged that the Most High God is ruler over human kingdoms and sets anyone he wants to over him. But you, his successor, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart even though you knew all this. So listen to that verse. Even though you knew all this, you haven't humbled yourself. So King Bel was not without knowledge of what had happened in King Neb's story. He understood how he was arrogant, how he had lost his kingdom, and how as he humbled himself before God, he was restored. In other words, he had read Daniel chapter 4, or he had at least read about that experience. Because remember, Daniel chapter 4 is an open letter from King Neb that he sent out to all the kingdom. So King Bel would have understood this. And So verse 23, "...instead you have exalted yourself against the Lord of the heavens." The vessels from his house were brought to you as you and your nobles, wives, and concubines drank wine from them. You praise the gods made of silver and gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or understand. But you have not glorified the God who holds your life breath in his hand and who controls the whole course of your life. Therefore, he sent the hand, and this writing was inscribed. This is the writing that was inscribed. Many, many, tekel, and parson. And this is the interpretation. Many means that the God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel means that you have been weighed on the balance and found deficient. Perez means that your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And then Belshazzar gave an order and they clothed Daniel in purple, placed a gold chain around his neck, and issued a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom at the age of 62. What an incredible story. How King Bel has this vision that terrifies him to his core. And how God brings the messenger Daniel in to share with him the message that God has given him. And the key verse in this entire section of scripture that we just read from verse, 50, from verse 5 all the way to verse 31 is that verse found in verse 22. Where it says, you, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. Our pride leads to our downfall. That's what pride does. It's like building a house on an elevated foundation of toothpicks. There's no way that it can stand. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. So if there is any area in your life where you can say, I don't need God, or where you think you can say, I don't need God, I can handle this myself, you have a pride problem. 
Acts 17, 25 says, God himself gives life and breath to all things. So listen this morning. If you are breathing oxygen this morning, then you are already dependent upon God. If you are alive today, you are dependent upon God. Whether you acknowledge God as Lord or not, whether you spit in the face of God, you're still dependent upon the Lord. Remember, the people that crucified Jesus to the cross were the result of Jesus' own creation. Colossians says that he holds all things in his hands. He holds all things together. The people were alive that nailed Jesus to the cross by the power of Jesus, by the power of God himself. And so this morning, we are all dependent upon the Lord. And so there is a solution, and it's there on your notes, but I want you to hold on to that because we're going to talk about it next week, okay? Because we've spent a lot of time talking about pride, and I think we need to stop here and have a little time of evaluation. I'm going to invite our praise team to come up and prepare for our invitation. You know, all of us, if we were to be honest with ourselves, would be in that situation where we have been measured in the balance and we have been found wanting. And we're going to talk about that more next week as we talk about it, um, as we talk about that specific message from the Lord. All of us are, are less than what we need to be. Pride has a way of pumping ourselves up, making us feel like we're invincible, making us feel like we could conquer the world, making us feel like we have all the knowledge, all the skills that we need to do what we need to do, making us feel like we're greater than ourselves. And then whenever you get these other things mixed in, you know, wealth, peer pressure, alcohol, those various things, they can even amplify it in any given moment. Listen, pride comes before a fall is what the scripture says, and pride will lead you astray every single time. And so this morning, I just want to encourage you to evaluate your life today. Is there something in your life this morning that is causing you to think a little more highly than yourself than you ought to? Romans chapter 12 warns about that. He says, don't let anybody think more highly than they ought to, but, but consider the grace that they have been given through Christ. You know, all of us, if we are here this morning, we are living under the power of the grace of Christ. If you're breathing air, you're receiving grace this morning. That's natural grace, the nat natural blessings that God gives to everyone. But if you've never come to a saving moment with Jesus Christ, never come to the point where you realize you are a sinner in need of a Savior, then you are not receiving that saving grace of Jesus that all of us desperately need. See, all of us in our natural state are being held together by God, but there's going to come a point where we breathe our last breath on this earth. And we're going to slip into an eternity separated from God in a very real place of punishment called hell. If you never give your life over to Jesus, that's what waits you on the other side. And no, no amount, amount of knowledge, no amount of wealth, no amount of position, no amount of prestige or power can save you from an eternity separated from God. And so this morning, I would encourage you today, humble yourself before the Lord. Cry out to God and say, I can't save myself. I need forgiveness of my sin. I need to be cleansed by my sin. I need a restored relationship to God the Father in hopes that, in a belief that He is going to give me eternal life that starts now and that lasts forever. The only way to receive that is to humble ourselves before Jesus and let Him be the Lord and Savior of our life. And if you've never done that, I want to encourage you to do that today. I'll be in the back this morning during invitation time or out here after the service. And I would love to talk with you about how you can have a relationship with Jesus. And if you're not ready for that, fill out that connection card and turn that in or go online and do that. I'll call you this week and we'll talk about what that means. For those of us who are believers, listen, we, we may have humbled ourselves before the Lord and we've accepted his salvation. But very often we come to places in our life where we begin leaning on our own abilities, our own skills. We begin to think more highly of ourselves than we should. This morning, if God has laid something on your heart, an area of pride that you need to re-surrender over to Him, I want to encourage you to do that as we sing this last song.